everybody. Uh, thanks for joining me. My name is Evan Radisic. I'm the Executive Director of the Cloud Software Association. Uh, thanks for joining us for another masterclass. Um, today we have with us Brett Owens. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, how to create a kind of a best in class referral partner program. Um, we've had these discussions uh, before, and there's quite a few members uh, that are running, either launching or kind of scaling uh, their partner programs, and a lot of those are affiliates. Um, so we've had sessions on the affiliate side, but uh, what we haven't discussed is this kind of notion of influencers. And obviously, everybody knows what they are, who they are. Um, but as far as uh, SaaS goes, it's it's relatively kind of new ground. Uh, so Brett, uh, Brett's been, you know, has has had quite a um, an eventful last decade. He's he's started uh, three SaaS companies and uh, most recently an influencer that that focuses on this kind of influencer model. Uh, but in the past, he's also had a company called Lead Dino, which was very much focused around affiliate marketing. So he's very well equipped uh, to talk about this. Uh, he's got, uh, you know, history there, uh, as well as some exciting new things in the works for the future. So um, I won't take up too much of the time. I think I already took up too much. Um, Brett, I'm going to hand it off to you, do a quick little intro, and then we'll get into it. And yeah, awkwardly, as awkwardly as you guys can, jump in there with questions. There's no easy way to do it. Go ahead, Brett. Yeah, sounds good. Cool. Thank you, Evan. Yeah, and uh, Evan, if you, Stacy, Jenny, anyone uh, on the horn has questions, you can just kind of interrupt me anytime as we go through here. Let me uh, get the screen of Joe. Do you want to flip the sharing over this way? Evan? Oh, yep. Yep. There, My bad. <laughs> go ahead. Oh, 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 good. Cool. I will get, uh, let me get the screen up here and then uh, talk a little about my uh, background. So, as Evan mentioned, is that up for everyone now? Good. Okay, cool. You're good. All right. Let me move the uh, panel over here. Cool. Yeah. So as I mentioned, I've been messing around in the affiliate influencer marketing space, reseller um, stuff for the last decade or so. It kind of started out in my first SaaS company. Uh, this is going back to like 2010 or 2011 uh, when we were looking to set up a reseller program for the first time and being stubborn software guys, we didn't build something off the shelf. We didn't buy something off the shelf. We kind of built our own solution which turned into um, its own animal here. So I'm going to kind of take you through my experience and not only running our affiliate tracking company, but then eating our own dog food and running a SaaS reseller partner program um, using our solution. Uh, but kind of the principles that you can, not that it's software specific, but more the business side of what I found to work from a SaaS affiliate program side of things, what I found to be a waste of time. And then as I've mentioned, kind of had uh, things kind of transitioned uh, really recently over to the influencer side. We started just saying influencer just to get people's attention about five years ago. Nobody really knew what influencers were. We knew a lot of our potential customers were looking for them. Um, but then in recent years, it's kind of turned into its own thing. And that's why, uh, you know, I've got a platform that's kind of geared toward that now. So it's sort of the evolution in recent years where uh, the company that I started in 2012 with two uh, other partners was called Lead Dino. And that was really focused on affiliate marketing and affiliate marketing at that time uh, was kind of a combination of things. The old school affiliates were the people who had a blog and they published unique content. And if you could get them to write about you, you give them an affiliate link and then you give them a percentage of your sale as a, as a commission. So that was kind of the dream from the affiliate standpoint. I would say at some point, affiliate marketing kind of took a turn, it really a turn for the worse. We're just being honest about it, where it, it turned into people um, who were savvy online marketers where they uh, you know, figured out, well, I don't actually need a blog. I don't actually need my own content. Just give me that link and let me just try to get the last click and then I will get credit for the sale that goes that way. Well, um, that's good living if you're that affiliate for us, uh, us marketers, it's kind of, it, it's bad because it's, it, they're just taking a fixed pool sales that are going to happen anyway. And then they're kind of scraping from that. So that's where I would say affiliate marketing kind of took, got a bad reputation um, over the last decade. But then we've seen in recent years that influencer side has come back. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily anything new. The platforms are new where you might have somebody on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, who are, uh, you know, using these types of links. Um, but they're still creating their own content. So it's kind of taking that initial blogger, that content creator, 
that started in the affiliate world 15, 20 years ago, and now just moving into different social media platforms. So with that, there are things such as influencer marketplaces and places where we can find people who would promote various types of products. We'll talk about that, um, where it's hot, whether or not it's applicable to SaaS yet, uh, and all that good stuff. And then uh, just a reminder for people hopping on, interrupt me anytime, just go ahead and jump in if you have questions. Uh, I'm not looking at the question, so you can just yell at me um, anytime. Yeah, and like if it's if it's super awkward, it's even better. So like if you can make <laughs> extra awkward, that would be great. <laughs> like right in the middle, I'll go like right I'll get right in the center. Yeah, like right now, like I'm interrupt. Yeah, like just yeah, like exactly. that. That's perfect. 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 <laughs> exactly. Like just be like Gavin. Um, so here's a screenshot. I kind of went through a trip down memory lane um, for myself as I was kind of prepping things. But this is a look at the what we call the affiliate dashboard at Lead Dino. This is basically what we gave to our partners, and we kind of called it their one-stop shop to promote our affiliate program. This is actually a look at the dashboard, which we set up for my very first company, which was the time tracking company. Um, our motivation there in that old school industry, we sold to like law firms, CPA firms. That's a really old software industry. I mean, that goes back to the eighties, nineties, where it was very reseller based. The resellers would go in, they would pop in like a CD ROM. They would install the software on site. Resellers are just always in that space. So if you wanted to break into the legal software market, you kind of had to get in with the resellers. So we came in, um, and Chromata, by the way, was the name of the company and, and Chromata still around. We came in with like the Clio's of the world, the Rocket Matters um, in, in 07, 08 into you know, 2010, 2011, and then 2012 when, uh, you know, we really got serious about the reseller program. But that was a common question in the industry is, hey, how to, because really, do you need a reseller to set up a SaaS product? That's always kind of the eternal question that we're asking, I think, with the Cloud Software Association is how do you partner with someone when um, you're almost kind of trying to figure out a need for them? Well, that was our, that was what we were trying to figure out is we didn't necessarily need a reseller to come in and install our software, but we definitely need the resellers to recommend our software. So what can we do to make it there? You know, what, what can we do to stay top of mind or have them recommend us? versus the same product they've been recommending for the last 20 years. Well, that's where a reseller program came um, out of it. So uh, we you know, ended up creating another company to support it. But the idea was that we had this little dashboard here, a one-stop shop where they could either use an affiliate code or referral link. And this is actually taken from an online publication, a blog basically that we were sponsoring. They had a blog podcast, they were called Lawyerist. And we would run ads with them um, every so often. And then to get more attention from lawyerists, we set up them up with a reseller program. So we gave them a 20% recurring commission and, um, and said, hey, anytime you send somebody our way, we will just kind of keep track of that and we'll do the recurring um, commission type of thing. So this is where they could use that link. And then the idea was that, okay, they'll use this link more often than they would otherwise if they're talking about us in normal editorial that we're not paying for. Well, maybe we're more likely to get mentioned. They'll use the affiliate link. And then if we can do a recurring thing, then if we're paying them every month, well, that's a good way for us to stay top of mind with them. So Sam was the guy's name. And if I'm PayPaling Sam every month, even if it's a modest fee, it's still kind of quote unquote passive income for Sam. So he sees that uh, PayPal payment from Brett, from Cremetta, and it kind of makes him feel warm and fuzzy inside. And then that progress you see on the bottom is kind of that dashboard where it's almost Sam's sales funnel. So it's saying how many visitors he sent us, 1,600 people used his link, just to kind of show some legitimacy that we're actually tracking um, the link as well. So it's kind of given some visibility to him where he can have confidence, at least he's seeing he's getting credit for clicks um, as he's using it, and then free trial signups and then purchases. Okay, so SaaS ended up, it, it was kind of a tough go um, from, uh, from a reseller standpoint, to be perfectly honest. So we start this new company dedicated to just the affiliate link tracking in 2012, Lead Dino, and um, our idea is that, okay, well, Chrometa needed this solution, and there's SaaS companies are kind of booming at the time, so that's where we want to go and um, try to sell our software into, and as usual, we were not completely wrong, but probably mostly wrong when, uh, when we started. SaaS was a really tough market to break into for us, um, even though there was a need. Um, the, the affiliate 
marketing side is not necessarily what you lead with as a marketer on the SaaS side. Uh, but fortunately, um, you're just kind of grinding your way through it. We did a Shopify integration early what? on, like in, in 2013. Yeah. Yeah, I leave tonight. So I think less. <clears throat> Sorry, any, any question? Is that Jody? Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize that I wasn't on mute. Sorry. Oh, all good. No, no, no. No, you're good. You're good. I was going to say that actually wins the most awkward. <laughs> yes, there you go. There that you was go. so awkward. It wasn't real. Gotcha. All right. <laughs> sorry. I wanted to be awkward for you, but. <laughs> Thanks. All right. All right. Hey, there's a, there's a new bar. Evan's, Evan's down a silver medal podium. <laughs> um. All right. So uh, until somebody else jumps in, um, I, again, kind of like a dumb luck thing. We, I don't want to say dumb luck because my co-founder had the idea, you know, brilliant idea worked out. He does the Shopify integration and we start marketing our affiliate tracking solution to Shopify merchants. And lo and behold, you know, they start kind of coming in. You know, you got something good when you have zero reviews and no credibility, and then people start kind of coming in and finding you. So we ended up uh, by the end of it being more 80% e-commerce. Um, 20% SaaS. So we'll kind of talk about both of those as we go. What I did end up still doing though, is running our affiliate program. I kind of piggybacked it on our regular marketing program. And, and by the way, again, we were a three person company for a while. So when I did the marketing side, I was kind of doing sales marketing, you know, doing a bunch of different hats and that type of thing. So I was, um, you know, we're not very specialized. I'm kind of looking at the whole marketing piece. And um, this is what we did for years is I would just, you know, we always had this, had that affiliate program going, but I would piggyback it on our regular marketing thing. So part of our regular marketing, something that worked very well for us was sending out a monthly newsletter, um, a monthly newsletter that would talk about the new features that we had. That always seemed to hit where we rattle off a bunch of new features, whether or not it was relevant for you. Uh, maybe it matters, maybe it doesn't, but it makes us look fresh, relevant. And then I would piggyback the affiliate program on the back of that and had good success actually um, doing that. A lot of the intangible type stuff, like, I mean, how many extra conversions were there? Honestly, I have, um, I have no clue, but it would give, us, give you a little extra juice where in that newsletter I would say, okay, um, you know, we're gonna go ahead and the newsletter on the left, I know it's a little bit of an eye chart here, but this is one I sent out. I think this was just a Sunday afternoon when I was bored and I just sent out this uh, customer newsletter to everyone and just broke it down and just said, hey, I'm paying $7.40 a click on Google um, and we're just kind of breaking even or probably losing money on it, but you know, $3,000 for the month. I would rather give this money to you guys if you can send us new customers. So sign up for our affiliate program and I'm paying people, um, you know, we're paying out 7,000 in commissions this month. Um, I said, that wasn't for the month. That was for a few months, but it was a bigger number to get people's attention. So I'm saying, okay, I got 21 affiliates I owe money to. I want more of you. So please sign up here, um, broke it down. Why 30%? And then we later took it down to 20% because Shopify was taking a chunk of that for a while. We always went as high as we could on the recurring commission and just, just thinking of it like another marketing channel. We were paying seven dollars a click on Google just to, to try to gain market share. I always looked at it that we would try to gain market share with the paid channels, and then the free stuff would kind of subsidize you through SEO. Obviously, you don't you don't necessarily pay for it after the fact. You may invest in content, but SEO kind of turns into a free channel. Shopify turned into a free channel. They would take their commission. 20% for a while, but we were still making 80%. And honestly, they were free leads. So with that in mind, as long as we're not getting crushed on the others, it could kind of help us gain market share, or at least if we break even. And I just kind of looked at it that way from the uh, affiliate program standpoint, where we, when, when we came out at 30%, that was just us saying, hey, if you can acquire a customer for me, we'll pay you 30%. And I'll pay you every month as long as the customer's with us. Uh, and that was just, you know, just to entice uh, them on that side. So that was something that we did see with our SaaS customers where there would be more success. I think you could get more attention, uh, just kind of putting that as, as high as you can. And then over on the right side, uh, that is just something I closed a lot of newsletters with where I would just, uh, you know, just a constant recruitment type thing in terms of getting more affiliates on board. Um, did that with Cremetta as well. So this was uh, a newsletter I dug out there and then I got my big cheesy join our affiliate program button. Uh, this thing was written in uh, AWeber 20, 2011 or 2012 or something like that. Oh no, 2014. Um, but you see, I mean, it's nothing, uh, 
n- nothing groundbreaking here, but we just kind of pounded on that every time. And then we would have people uh, sign up and they would just kind of join that affiliate program. Most would do nothing, but affiliate programs are kind of like a numbers game. And uh, we'll kind of talk about that um, in a couple of minutes as well. So when I talked about piggybacking, the, mo- the monthly flow, the monthly marketing flow, I kind of based everything off of that monthly newsletter. And I said, okay, what are we going to talk about this month? And we would try to hit from different angles because they're always trying to think of something. What'll get someone who didn't open last month's newsletter open this month? So we might talk about taxes, tax, and I pulled our CPA on one of these things. And we talked about tax treatment for affiliates. Um, I was actually kind of a bust. I mean, we got through the whole webinar and I didn't realize that you, then he said, well, as long as you're paying via PayPal, you don't really need to track this stuff. Um, and we were paying everyone via PayPal. So anyway, we did this whole event and I never actually talked to him before. So he comes in the office, we do a webinar like this. And then he's like, oh, now if you're paying with PayPal, you're fine. Um, but anyway, we would kind of do stuff like that where, okay, maybe someone's thinking about taxes. Maybe somebody's got a feature that they wanted from us for years. And then if we're teasing this feature list, we'll get that going. Um, and then, uh, so this was a newsletter we sent out early, early 2018. So eight hot features to 2018, just kind of taking the stuff that we did in the back half of the year and, um, you know, just kind of piggyback that. So turn that into a blog post. And then this newsletter, then we would do an affiliate newsletter. And it's just rehashing that, but it's telling affiliates, kind of giving them something new to share. So instead of just sending people to our homepage, it was kind of, I mean, boring. Every SaaS homepage is kind of the same thing. They could send it to the blog post, eight hot new lead dino features. I mean, does anyone in the world, broader world care? Not really, but in our little corner of the universe, then we could kind of turn it, try to turn it into a big deal. At least it gives them something unique to share. So when they would click those social links that you see there, and those would be embedded in the email. And by the way, it's not just lead dino. A lot of, a lot of products do this now. And, and I would check out whatever you're currently using to see, because I'm sure they've got something like this um, embedded now. We were kind of unique at the time, but you know, SaaS is where everyone kind of something successful, everyone does it. But if you if they would click that Facebook button, it would tee up a link to that blog post, the eight hot uh, lead down features for 2018. And it had their tracking stuff all embedded and they could share it on Facebook get two likes or something for something so boring. Right. But um, it would be a link that they would get credit for. And then for us, it was just kind of like free social media coverage. So it just kind of was a nice way to do it. um, A nice way to get some extra scale on our newsletter. We're sending out our newsletter out, you know, we would grow it through the years. We're sending out to five, 10,000. Then over time, we're up to like 20 or 25,000 sort of in uh, towards the end there. Um, I would always like to lead with the payment news to the affiliates. So on the monthly side, I would also say, Hey, commission's going out today. Just everyone's coin operator. So this is a nice way to kind of get their attention, send out those commission payments. So I talked about this at the Cremetta side. So I like to do the monthly things. This is us paying our partner Equid their own partner share, but that was just kind of the idea. And that's why I ended up gravitating towards the recurring thing. um, Because even though it would take me a couple minutes just to click, PayPal, all the PayPal buttons and send it out. And I would send them out as different line items so our accountants could kind of track that um, back to who we were paying. But I I like to do it every month and I would take the extra time just because I like the, you know, thinking about it from the recipient standpoint. Again, it's that dream. It's sort of passive income. I mean, they did something once maybe, but it keeps us top of mind. And I just like them to get that PayPal payment every month um, there. So I like that better than doing the one time thing. We did experiment with Cremata. We used to do uh, either you would get, I can't remember if I got a slide on this. I might have a slide on this, but you could get paid a hundred bucks up front if someone stuck for six months um, or a recurring thing, because I don't want to pay out a lot of people on the, on the, you know, end, but ended up uh, gravitating towards the recurring thing, I think uh, ended up working. So again, as I mentioned, we would encourage affiliates to promote new blog links. So this was a podcast that I was on. And then again, it just kind of makes a big deal out of stuff that it just, you create your own little buzz in, 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 in this world um, that, uh, you know, you kind of just try to seem like a big deal. So obviously if the, the cloud software association, that would be top front and center of uh, any sort of marketing or blog post that we would do here. And, and again, we would get it up on the blog and uh, just kind of talk about that. And then that's a good opportunity. So affiliates can point um, stuff there as mentioned, if nothing else, we would get some free social media shares and you would see this on an ongoing basis where I would just get, you know, pop-ups on my phone, so-and-so retweeted, so-and-so tagged in a tweet and nine times out of 10, it was the pre-written content that we had. So the Facebook share, that was stuff that we could write for them. 
they could still edit uh, an affiliate could still edit it, but that was something that, that we would write for them. Same on the tweet. They could write that, but um, you know, we would still, um, we would have stuff for them nine times out of 10, they would tweet exactly what I wrote. So I would try to keep that fresh every month with like a different angle, just so it didn't get repetitive. But again, kind of cool to see just getting free. Um, you would get a free level of uh, buzz just kind of coming from that move into the, shall we say gray hat uh, side of things. If you're looking for reviews, and again, be careful with this because um, different sites, different policies on their reviews. Shopify, from our experience, very strict. It just you know, through the years, cannot offer any sort of incentives on uh, for paying on Shopify. My experience, Google, Facebook, they don't check it at all. And if you turn your affiliates loose, give you some reviews, you'll get some nice reviews up on Google. So a lot of our uh, lead dinos, 25 star reviews, just saying they came from affiliates who uh, I wouldn't kind of lead with that, but I'd say, hey, if you want a little bonus, uh, throw up a review for us and you can get that done. So um, again, be careful with it because it depends on the channel. But again, a lot of these review sites, in my mind, they're, they're, they're corrupt and they're extortionist on their side. Not saying Google is, but um, there are certain sites that, uh, let's say we know what they do on the review standpoint. So if you can get an affiliate helping you out there. And again, I like doing the affiliate side because a lot of times they were users. So at least there was an element of legitimacy to it there where they didn't know our product and um, getting them to leave a review. It's a pretty legit review. Um, and we might give them a little kicker and you'd be surprised 10 bucks uh, uh, extra on the affiliate payment. And someone might take the time to leave a review for you. Hey, Brett. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I want to just kind of point out, like, as I think uh, I know when I was running my affiliate program, like, you know, there was there was always a kind of drive for the revenue side. So it's like, how can you bring me customers? Right. But what we kind of overlooked was this like marketing piece, because it was always like you were either talking to the head of sales or or head of marketing. And <clears throat> with the marketing it was always a kind of an irrelevant conversation a lot of times because it was like, hey, like we just want revenue out of these guys. But I think there's definitely an opportunity to like, hey, we've got, especially when you're into like, we were into like 200, 250 affiliates, you know, half of them engage, maybe, maybe less. Mm -hmm. But if you could capture some portion of that, especially in the segments that you're after, like, for example, like one month you're after agencies and A, B, and C or whatever, and you know who they are, and you segment them properly and say, you can reach out to those 50 or 60 affiliates and say, hey, we're doing a campaign this month on just social shares, we want to promote this new feature that's coming out, right? To that level of sophistication in an affiliate program is like, it's really rare to see in, in SaaS companies. They usually just focus on, here's a click. If they sign up, we pay you, right? Which is, I feel like just only scratching the surface of what the capability of a truly like high function affiliate program can be, right? So I don't want this to like go, like slip by as just like, a given like a lot of SaaS companies do not do this so um just yeah um just want people to absorb it <laughs> yeah 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 great point yeah yeah that's a great point Evan and I do um yeah I think in a few slides coming up yeah to your point um we did use that and we kind of used our affiliate program with agencies also um and um yeah actually yeah, I'll, I'll kind of tell yeah I do have our uh, example I want to go through but um, yeah, no, to your point, because it almost, I'm glad you brought that up because anytime you look at like an affiliate program from a SaaS company, a lot of times you're like, why are we spending any money on it? Because it doesn't necessarily, it, 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 they're kind of lower numbers just from up. Yeah, revenue is always going to be lower. Like it's just yeah. the way, yeah. like you kind of have to know what you expect unless you have like thousands of them. But even then it's like you're, it becomes so much to manage for such a low incremental, like without a strategic partner, like the bigger, the work on bigger deals, if it's just a straight referral, like it's so hard to make yeah. it work if you're just looking at the revenue. But if you're looking at the social impact, brand awareness, all the other things, it becomes a little bit easier to justify putting resources into it. Yeah, it, right, right. That's where it almost, it, it, I think it helped us just being for a while, um, you know, three-man shop because we didn't have, we weren't segmented in terms of there was nobody to report up to. So I could, you know, I was doing all the marketing so I could kind of see it, weave it in like, okay, well, I could use the affiliate program to support this stuff. Um, whereas, yeah, if I was, if, if there was an affiliate person or a partner person just reporting up, you might just say, well, why are you? 
why are you even bothering? Um, we even had, I mean, you had really good engagement because we were, and I think I, I, I've got someone on this also, but we had over 3,000 affiliates and less than 50 would ever really do much or 100 even sent, sent clicks. So it was really like a numbers game. But I think part of it also was if, if you kind of have that monthly flow automated where everything I kind of showed, I mean, it, on the affiliate side, I, I would spend an hour or two a month on it. So hour or two a month to support 3,000, I wasn't necessarily calling them up. And then to your point, if I want to reach out to, you know, parts of that segment, you can, you can do that separately. Cool. So, um, yeah, I think that helps as well. Yeah, we'll get into that example in a moment. Um, we did then in, in 16... The question we keep kept getting, and a lot of this was from Shopify merchants. So they had uh, some sort of product that they were coming to us. They have a beauty product, skincare, hoodies, you name it. And they come in and they install our app and they're all excited because they're like, okay, this is great. This is exactly the type of marketing we want to do. I've got my skincare product. It's new. I put in a lot of money to start this company. So if someone can sell it on a commission basis, that's the dream. They install Lead Dino, they get their tracking links, and they say, okay, now send me the affiliates. And then we, for a while, we said, well, that's not really what we do. We do the tracking. We don't necessarily, here's how you can find your own. So I tried to do training resources around how to find their own affiliates. I mean, at the end of the day, everyone just wants a one-click solution. So this is something we kind of did a foray into. We started building our own affiliate network, and we tried to do it for e-commerce products. Um, we ended up building up to about 15,000 affiliates where we, had, we would send a newsletter like this on the right side, and we would segment that based on the uh, seg uh, interest. So health products, fitness, wellness, beauty, uh, fashion, that type of thing. Um, limited success with that. It was more at the time, it kind of, as I said, kind of worked. It was very expensive to build. Um, because you, you really got to not only build it out, the sizzle was great. Uh, the, the merchants loved the idea that we had an affiliate network. It would work for some products, but um, it's really expensive to build and recruit these guys. So kind of at the end of the day in 2019, um, that's where I kind of differed from my co-founders. They kind of lost interest in, in this and wanted to focus on the core, the core product, core technology. And I just wanted to go this route. I just thought, thought this was the future and this is where the next kind of battleground was going to be as our everyone, you know, everyone copycats everyone's features. So um, that was kind of our first foray into it. And then I'll kind of circle back um, on that thought as we get into the influencer side in a moment. I will say we did have a SaaS category for, because we were still about 20% SaaS uh, customers. So we did have a SaaS category and then we would do newsletters devoted to SaaS products. And a lot of these actually, you'll, you, this is actually, I pulled this from one of our, um, one of our, 2018 or so newsletters, but you see it's kind of similar commission to what I'm talking about where they do the recurring. It's in that 20 to 30% range. What I found is that SaaS products are a little bit wide just to hit an affiliate network. Um, you know, if you're, if you're like a beauty influencer, um, that's a, a lot easier, I think, to target someone with someone's like, I resell SaaS. I mean, that's a very kind of wide um, range there. So where we kind of had more success, and this kind of to, to Evan's point about segmenting, um, this was very early. I think this was 2014 when we got into Shopify and we had no reviews and really no friends and, and no reason for anyone to try our app, um, but we did have the affiliate program. So I approached a company, they were called Shopify Ninjas at the time, and, and they had pivoted over to Black Belt Commerce, but they were one of the kind of development shops that were setting up a lot of Shopify stores. So I'm kind of staring at their site. I'm like, somehow we got to get in front of these guys I've got this affiliate program. We'll pay him a 30% commission. I don't know why they would care though, because we're nobody. So why would they want 30% of something that might be nothing? So, um, so I, it's funny, I just kind of dug up the email and I emailed them. And I said, uh, I found the managing partner said, I'm like, they got a blog. Maybe if I approach them about sponsorships for their blog, I don't think they do sponsorships, but at least it means I'm serious and I've got a budget to spend. And if I'm willing to throw money at them, I don't see how they're going to say no. And then maybe that can get the conversation going. So this is actually an email that I sent. And this actually got the, this did get the conversation going where it kind of came back. Um, and I knew they didn't do sponsorships, but then he kind of made something up where he's like, we can do a multi-month sponsorship. And by the way, I would like to track out, you, uh, check out your affiliate tracking um, app and that type of thing. And then this is what we worked out. It was $500 a month for two months. So I sent him $1,000. 
Um, I did not ask for a review, but then he came back with this. And he said, we'd like to review your app. And then they said, it was a great, you know, it was a very nice, very nice review. We did give him money and then I gave him an affiliate link. And I think the links here are affiliate links to us, but that was a good way to get things going. And to me, this was kind of like a blend of influencer marketing and affiliate. And again, this is 2014 or so, but I kind of gave him a thousand, this would be the equivalent of today's paper post in the influencer world where we kicked him a thousand bucks. Um, for the sponsorship. I don't think they'll do this today, by the way, their minimum engagement is way, uh, they've done really well and they won't even touch projects, I think that are below five or, or 10,000. So I don't think a thousand dollars from me today would have gotten me anywhere, but it was kind of right place, right time, especially with this agency where everything was kind of um, early on. But I guess my point is uh, there, there wasn't going to get his attention with the recurring, but kind of combining that and then, oh, okay, we got the sponsorship. So that adds some legitimacy. I didn't, I didn't offer to pay for a review. I offered to sponsor. He comes back with the review. That honestly really got us going in the Shopify ecosystem between that. And then he leaves us a review in the store. And then um, for, on behalf of one of his clients, because he's using it for one of his clients and it works out. And then they're sending us some clients their way. So that was a good way to kind of um, get that ball rolling. So I, I think, you know, kind of close the loop on our conversation with, if you're sub-segmenting, that's a nice way to kind of approach, especially those strategic partners, is sort of that blend of what's a way that we can sponsor them and, and just, you know, kind of get that conversation rolling. So that got it rolling. And then as the years went on, someone was looking for Shopify setup, we were able to send them their way. Of course, as I mentioned, they ended up getting kind of too big for a lot of people that we would send them. But again, they got the relationship rolling um, uh, from that standpoint. That does kind of transition to sort of the influencer world where, um, and again, this, these are kind of e-commerce examples that I've got here, but this is how um, we slice and dice uh, my new company, Influencer. Uh, this is kind of how we slice and dice these opportunities. So someone, and for example, Kira Grace, they do uh, yoga fitness um, products and they're looking for yoga fitness influencers so they can slice and dice their demographics on the right side in terms of what they're looking for. And this is just kind of listed now. So they're going to pay up to $50 a post. So the, what you're seeing now in the influencer networks is that um, it's like any sort of marketing where it's just kind of getting sliced and diced based on, okay, I've got a CBD product and uh, I'm willing to pay up to $25 a post or $50 a post. I'm looking for wellness influencers or it's CBD recovery lotion. I'm looking for wellness and fitness because I want these active influencers um, who can do it. I don't have a big budget, but I want to get their attention. So I will offer something up front. So I might do $25, $50 a post. And then I'm going to add a commission on top because, hey, if they want to share my link later, I want them to keep doing that. So now you're kind of seeing a blend of this stuff um, happen. So this is how we have things set up in our app now, it's been that way for about a year. When we started the company, kind of rolled it off of the um, affiliate network that I showed you from the lead dyno side where my co-founders didn't want to invest in that anymore. Um, we had like nothing for a year, like literally nothing but sort of an email list. And we just kind of operated like an agency and you just kind of make stuff up as you go. So I had a CBD brand I was trying to find influencers for. So and this is COVID, so we're in lockdown, and I've got my daughter sleeping in my back seat, and I take her to the garden store, but she fell asleep. So now I'm like texting my sister-in-law, who does jazzercise in Kansas City, to try to find one of her friends with some followers who can do a post for $100 for the CBD brand. So it's funny, you do this stuff um, just kind of on the fly, but then it shows you what the market's looking for, what the, and then kind of how to structure um, the app to support that stuff. So um, that's kind of how the influencer world is kind of moving today. Um, definitely very relevant in the Shopify world. And then we're seeing um, for the brands, I mean, aligning the interest is kind of the key thing. So it might be a beauty brand. They only ship to the U.S. And again, this is more e-commerce than SaaS we're talking, but a beauty brand, they ship to the U.S. They want female influencers. They may want mom influencers because um, uh, they, they, know, they know their demographics. They know their end customer. And then that's who they're trying to reach. So that's kind of how we're um, seeing things going on that side of thing, they might say, okay, I want somebody with 20,000 or more followers. I want Instagram, um, TikTok, and YouTube, and then uh, kind of getting uh, that pool of potential people and then matches up with what uh, the brand itself is looking for. Um, the thing I'm finding on the influencer side is I've uh, been very impressed by the legitimacy of um, people who sign up. I don't really pay attention to each sign up um, in our app, but we just did a feature on Canadian 
um, influencers um, just for you guys. And uh, I was, you know, impressed. We had a, an Olympian um, from the volleyball team, a beach volleyball team, um, in the in the feature. So I what what I found on the influencer side is that the um, I think the quality of the content, followers, the reach is way above and beyond what we saw in our affiliate network in 2016. And I think it's, I don't know what, I think it's, I think it's the different platforms that people have access to. So if they want to do their stuff on, uh, they, they want to create content on Instagram or TikTok, I think it's more accessible than 20 years ago when you start off a, a blog and do all your uh, kind of old school content there. Um, podcasters, right? So there's just all these different types of platforms that are sort of enabling this. And um, long story short, the reach and the quality has gone up. And I think the the real value is not necessarily in the in the Kardashians or the Rock, and the, you know they'll a ton of reach, but they'll charge you six figures. And it's a very broad focus. Where if you're looking more at the micro influencer. Um, type realm, you can get somebody who's very specific um, to this. So for a fitness brand, why not get a former Olympian to sponsor um, that type of thing? So um, that's right. something that's unique. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, this is a question. Like, obviously, the, affiliate, the uh, influencer market is a very consumer focused thing, but there are B2B influencers, uh, which most of us probably are interested in marketing agencies in one or whatever. Yeah. Uh, what would you say is our, our strategy to go find them? and attract them and what is going on in that, that market? Yeah, that's a good, good question. Stan. Let me see if I've got the, uh, okay. Yeah. So let me hop up to a um, um, guy like Bradford here. So uh, yeah, the, to your points in here, yeah, it is starting to branch out and it, where, right. That's what you're looking for now is there. And we, we see that in our app where it's kind of populating. We have the business interest and then the marketing under, underneath there. And um, Bradford I'm working with here on a, on a financial uh, type thing as well, you know, very, uh, you know, he's investor looks good in the suit and, and he's just per, kind of perfect for that side of things as well. So on the SaaS side, yeah, you're seeing um, that. So I think it's a matter of just kind of finding, I don't think that, I don't think these networks and I'll speak for our network. I don't think we're mature enough yet where you can run your whole sort of recruitment effort off of it. Cause you're not seeing all the agencies listed, but uh, you are seeing more and more kind of come in there. So I think it's kind of a combination of sort of hunting and finding your own uh, from the ecosystems. Like we talked about the Shopify. Uh, if you're in Shopify, you got to find the Shopify developers. Um, but it is, I would say you're at the point where it would be worth getting on a few influencer networks and just seeing who's there, just setting up your, um, your so profile. You're seeing like a kind of a more influencers coming in, actually um, kind of merging in, and focusing on SaaS products or technology in general. Like, is that, cause I mean, this has been around in e-commerce for, for quite a while. Right. Um, and it's pretty, it, it's, it's, it's mature. In fact, it's kind of blowing up and it's probably like in a burst or something at this point, but, um, I, I'm curious how that translated into sex is right now, you know, there's obviously like review sites, there's, um, and I've worked with, with quite a few all over North America that will say, Hey, we'll write a review for you guys and blah, blah. blah. And they're, that, that's kind of an influencer, like you said, you know, uh, in your earlier example, but, you know, in that traditional model where it's like, hey, I have, I don't know, 300,000 followers, a million followers. I talk about, you know, agency issues. I talk about, um, you know, technology, new technology for sales enablement. Like you just, for, for good reason, I guess people don't look for those because they're, I mean, they're not as interesting as like golf or something that, you know, that you mm -hmm. want to follow yeah. on, a, on a social media network. But are you seeing like, what what stage is that in now like is there is there an emergence or are we talking about just like a few early adopters like a sprinkle here a sprinkle there or is it is it a thing it's a thing but it's still early yeah it's right. still early so yeah to your point like e-commerce is very mature on this and um well it's mature with respect to SaaS and, and business stuff um you're starting to see it with uh you know, podcasters is not a bad way to do it. So you're starting to see podcasters sort of post uh, up on these networks. I think I had something for YouTubers as well. Um, yes, TikTok and, and YouTubers is kind of one of my thoughts for SaaS is 
uh, we just rolled out this in our in our own app, and this is obviously it's available with YouTube's API. So you're going to see this in other networks as well, where you can pull the YouTube stats um, for that person. And YouTube just kind of something. It's more, um, I would say, conducive to SaaS and business type stuff because you can sit there and you can talk for ten minutes, or we're talking for an hour today, um, versus something like you know, and, and you know, TikTok to an extent too. You, you I saw a story on NPR yesterday with. TikTokers who are featuring congressional members who are buying stocks and they're doing so anyway there's more of a finance focus you're seeing on TikTok and um, YouTube where I think they're you can get a little more in depth obviously TikTok's kind of a soundbite YouTube's going to get you a little more in depth than um, like Instagram and Instagram's gonna be a tough channel for um, SaaS and that type of stuff so um, but Instagram is it, it made sense that if you're just doing a, a e-commerce product and it's a picture of a necklace Instagram's perfect. So um, I think as, as these channels kind of come up more, we're seeing that more. Um, what I would probably do, and I, I mean, I probably need to do this. Actually, I, I kind of have this on my own to-do list is to check out some of the other networks also to see, and because and they're, they're more obviously more mature um, influencer networks, but they're all pretty new. But stuff that I think is worth checking out, Grin, Upfluence, um, these are all more um, enterprise networks, but I think they're worth um, looking at just to see who they have. From, from that standpoint, because it's, it's early on, but I think it's worth, I think it's probably mature enough to at least take a look at at this point. Cool. So let me talk about our own, um, oh, I guess a couple of differences then, affiliate to influencer. It, it's more of a, you kind of talk to each person. So we do intros, even if we're recruiting for an affiliate program and we do see that, but there's still kind of that initial touch point, even if it's just a kind of a direct message. Thanks for applying. You can sign up for our affiliate program here. That's something that's a little different. Where affiliate programs, you just kind of have that page, the monolith, and you're just trying to send people there. So it's a little more personal, um, we found on this side as, um, as well, even if it's just kind of like a quick hit. So the uh, touch points, um, we rolled out this chat feature and this has worked well. And I mean, this just kind of mirrors Instagram. So that's what you see on Instagram where um, you DM people back and forth. Um, ironically, when we write up influencers, we try to let them know about it. Um, and me being an old man, I uh, had us emailing them at first and, and, and luckily we recruited somebody better than me and she's on Instagram and she just follows them and DMs them and we get way better response just DMing influencers on Instagram. So it's, it, it's funny how that, you know, channels kind of change, but yeah, the touch point thing, it's more, more so, uh, and again, more of like a direct message, um, kind of thing. But it, it's funny with businesses because you, you don't know who's necessarily manning their Instagram account. It could be a black hole. Uh, it might not be the person. So that's somewhere that's different from e-commerce, I think, than um, you know, this type of thing. So again, that's probably a more of an argument for looking at the YouTuber who might be talking about a SaaS product because they're more likely to be manning their own Instagram page versus a reseller um, who they may not even be talking to the person who's, who's doing their social media stuff. Um, so it's more of a probably, you know, quality over quantity type deal. Also just my kind of two experiences. So I started two collabs for us at Affluencer. Um, I haven't figured out a good way to target the brands yet. So I'm still kind of noodling on that, but we have, you know, obviously to recruit more influencers, it's been helpful. I've worked with 74 uh, of our own influencers so far, and that's been since summer. So it's about half a year's worth of um, worth the collab work. Contrast that, I mentioned with Lead Dino, we had over 3,000 affiliates, not nearly the engagement that Evan had, um, probably, you know, 50 or 100. And I, you know, we rarely just talk to a few of those a month. So it was much bigger pool, much lower type of engagement talking with here for our collabs. I mean, it's a couple messages back and forth, but I do talk to everyone who we do, a, um, who we do something with. So yeah, I mentioned Bradford, mentioned kind of the, the branching out, I would say of um, the classic profiles, uh, podcasters. This is what we list for our own collabs. Again, I think this is more applicable to e-commerce than, you know, perhaps a SaaS thing currently, but the same, I think, principle applies to um, a YouTuber or someone who we're looking to reach, where we just kind of define what, what tier we're looking for in terms of the platform, the number of followers, and then what we're looking to pay. And I with our brands who we work with, I would kind of recommend slicing and dicing this. Just you get your expectations aligned 
um, before you have the, that initial conversation. And if you're doing a commission only thing, then you do a separate one for commission only. So they know it's an affiliate um, type opportunity. One thing I like a lot about uh, this side is that the influencers hand, handle it creative and not me. So I just get them rolling and I let them know what we're looking for link to our site and, and give us a shout out. And then um, that's all we got. And uh, they just kind of run with it. It's in their words. I don't edit it at all. I don't actually even ask to see it before. Um, and, you know, it's a nice luxury because if we're paying $50 a post or even up to $200 a post, it's not a huge expense. We can just kind of run with it and just kind of see what happens. But we have noticed um, successful quote unquote spikes on days where this 45 new user day for us, which is big for us, um, that was on a day where we did the collab. But again, um, these are influencers I'm bringing in mostly as the new users. Um, you know, not exactly an applicable uh, one for SaaS. I do think that the sort of that YouTube and TikTok is kind of the new frontiers and where I would look for, I think, on the business side and on the SaaS side. Bloomberg had an article last week about financial influencers and how they're driving traffic to, uh, I forgot, some, yeah, some of the new kind of fintech SaaS companies, but they're actually having a lot of success. One of them didn't even know where all their new um, accounts came from. So, um, and then they trace it back to one of their influencer partners. So some of these guys are making, in the finance world, uh, the, the article was saying there's a big gap between uh, sort of the brands and then the content creators on the financial side. So some of these guys are making half a million dollars a year or more on the, um, just on the, on that side, just kind of promoting the new accounts. Some of them are doing it on an affiliate basis. Some are doing it per post. Uh, but again, this is the financial side, but again, these are SaaS products there. So it does depend who you're kind of thinking through who your target um, audience is. The, if you have a financial SaaS product, I guess it's nice because then you just find that financial person. So it's kind of a nice vertical thing where if you're selling, like for our example, I mean, if we're selling affiliate marketing or influencer marketing software, you got to kind of think through like who your end user is and what they're following. So um, if you're on Shopify, you might want to follow, um, but then there's a the sub segments there. So you almost want to find like a, uh, if you have a marketing app like we do on Shopify, you know, I should probably be looking at like the Shopify marketing um, type people slicing through. So again, partner program, helping us feed the reviews. Um, I just do this after our collab. I'll offer them a little bonus. They want to review us on Google reviews or Facebook because it's, you know, kind of um, harmless as far as I can tell. And um, we've got, you know, we're able to get some great reviews and they happily do it. And they're, these are all people who are users, actual users of the product. So um, they can get that going and then they get a little kicker on their, um, on their collab. So that's, you know, that's helped us do it kind of like a why not type of, um, type of thing. Um, so that's, I guess, what I had. I'm happy to kind of get into any more questions, discussion, brainstorm. Here's how to contact me. I'm on the CSA uh, Slack also around most of the time. And then this is our company info here and all that stuff. And then chat on the site. Anyone, anyone uh, can find me if you go to our site on, on chat as well. But anyway, happy to- Thanks, Brad. That was great. Um, I think you kind of nailed it on the uh, one thing that's kind of interesting. I mean, this is this is definitely um, outside of the normal we usually do with these sessions, obviously, because it's it's early on. But I thought it'd be interesting for people to at least think about it. Right. Um, predominantly, you kind of mentioned that there, like on the podcast side, like there's a lot of tech podcasts and like content on YouTube. It's less an Instagram. It's not really like I would kind of forget about Instagram for this, but it's more yeah. so like on the live audio video kind of content right so that is definitely emerging um reviews for sure like see what's happening with g2 g2 crowd like only just in the last couple of years um so it's it's enough it like you said it's it's big enough that you should start kind of paying attention to it um might be too early to really start putting money into it but in the next 12 months who knows what's going to happen it, it's definitely worth kind of keeping a keeping an eye out and especially if there's like like podcasts that you know um resonate with your product like if it's a really popular i don't know digital agency show or something like that and you're in the martech um space try to get in there right that that is technically an influencer so like um just think so outside of the box and don't think it's like i gotta i gotta have an affiliate link in a instagram post for a cbd oil you know Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Evan. Yeah, you remind, reminded me back, this is back in the Cremetta days, but we did a uh, podcast sponsorship. It was, it was part of Jason Calacanis' network, but it wasn't his. So we didn't have to pay an arm and a leg. It was like this week in, this week in freelancers. 
something like that. And we did an eight week bit and um, the host, he would bring us on, you know, he would, he, we, we were kind of like their only sponsor. So it was downstream, but it was kind of connected because it was freelancers and then freelancers need to track their time. And then he would recommend us. And then uh, eventually we beat on him enough with the advertising, he started using it himself. Um, I like getting in early um, to your point, because I, if you can get in early, you're just going to get a much better deal. And at least you can put a little marketing dollars at it and just kind of see what works. And I know everyone gets caught up on tracking and this and that. And this is almost like, I don't know. I just kind of look at this stuff. Like if you can get in early and you can spend some money, maybe they'll use the promo code they read on a podcast or, um, or through a, 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 you know, TikTok clip or, or maybe they won't, but then you can see if there's activity, extra activity for that day and stuff. And if you're just spending a few hundred dollars, it might be worth just kind of sprinkling it around. It, it's nice to get in early because once this stuff starts to ramp up, then it does get exponentially more like a, like a big podcast. They're ex really expensive to um, sponsor. I was looking at a, a website. There's a marketing website. I forgot the name of it. Um, Oh, is the brew? I think they're marketing. Yeah, stuff. And I'm like, oh, that might be cool for Affluencer. And then I go through the media kit and it's, you know, $40,000 minimum for a campaign. So gone are the days there of like being able to sponsor for a few hundred bucks. So um, yeah, nice and that's the thing. Early. Yeah. And that's yeah. the thing. Like if, you, if you're looking at, you know, what, you know, say 150 or 200 uh, um, affiliate network brings you on a monthly basis uh, and what it costs to run it, like it makes sense to trial a few of these campaigns and then if something works you kind of double it down it's just like um people have a tendency especially in SaaS companies any of these affiliate networks to just rinse and repeat rinse and repeat it's like we recruit some affiliates we you know give them some of the content we give them you know this these abc and then we just do the same thing over and over again it's just like a volume thing and it's been accepted as this like, oh yeah, affiliate partner program is just a volume play. It's minimal revenue, but it's like, you know, it keeps on tricking, tr tricking, like, you know, you'll get up the revenue, but to, to kind of step back from that and be like, okay, is there let, like, let's, tr let's try two new things this quarter, right? Like whether they work or not is beside the point, but let's try two new things. And you've tried two things every quarter. That means at the end of the year, you're probably going to discover one or two things that you're like, oh, you know what? There's value in that. Next year, we're going to incorporate that in a strategic plan. That adds value to what you're doing, but also kind of, you know, when you talk and you see, or like, it's like, hey, I'm I'm constantly refining this formula. It's not a rinse and repeat. So anyway, th that was kind of my my goal with this. The session was just to kind of get people thinking a little bit outside the box on the affiliate side. And um, but yeah, Brett, thanks a lot, man. It was it was super informative. Um, but yeah, if anybody has any questions now, great. If not, um, like Brett said, um, he's in the CSA, so we can always, uh, you always post your questions there and we'll get them answered, uh, on the Slack channel. Uh, but yeah, I'm sorry, I missed, uh, most of the, the meat of the presentation, but, uh, I don't know if you guys are going to have a, a recording available. Or maybe I can just reach out to Brett. Yeah, yeah, no, we'll have a recording for sure. But uh, because you're late, you actually have to write a report on this whole thing. So we're going to... I will. Yeah. I, happily, I will happily do that because I take a lot of notes anyway. I'll just send you my notes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, perfect. All right. So you're going to take notes on this whole thing and then you're going to uh, send it to me and I'll email it to everybody. It's, it's kind of like a uh, recap. That's great. Awesome, Shanjay. Thanks a lot for that. Um, Anyway, um, thanks a lot, everybody, for joining me, um, and we'll uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks, Brett. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, thanks, everyone. Bye.